Good afternoon, everyone. In this tutorial, I shall be giving a detailed insight into how CGen can be used to rapidly generate GNU assemblers, disassemblers, and simulators for RISC-V. This work has been driven by a customer requirement to be able to prototype new RISC-V instructions in software with a 24-hour turnaround from specification to working toolchain. As a result of this work, we have also been able to provide a generic GNU simulator for use with GDB. These patches are currently up for review upstream. While I hope at the end you will be able to go away confident that you understand how to use CGen for your own projects, this is a big subject. The tutorial is being recorded and my slides will be available afterwards. I am assuming that you all have basic knowledge of the, the components of a compiler toolchain, specifically the key elements of a GNU compiler toolchain. To help you understand CGen in more detail, I have provided a link to my colleague Jeremy Bennett, uh, who talked at the GNU Tools Cauldron in 2018 on this subject. I will also provide a link to the M M Cosm Git repository, where you can find a complete working system with our latest work, including support for Bitmanip instruction set extension. I have used this repository for all the examples in this talk. The first half of this talk is a quick introduction to CGen. It is a shortened and updated version to Jeremy's talk from the GNU Tools Cauldron. I shall then look at the challenges of making CGen work with RISC-V, particularly where we need to support both 32-bit and 64-bit architectures and numerous instruction set extensions. I shall go into more detail on instruction sets by looking at Maxim's work implementing a CGen model for the proposed bit manipulation extension. This has allowed us to rapidly change the assembler and simulator as the specification evolves. Finally, I shall look at the current status of CGen and future work that may make automated generation of toolchain components even easier. CGen was developed by Doug Evans initially on an MSC project. It starts with a semi-formal description of the syntax and semantics of an instruction set architecture written in C in scheme, sorry. From the scheme description, CGen generates two libraries, libopcodes and libsim, used at the heart of the assembler, disassembler, and the simulator. CGen also has the hooks to generate documentation and a test framework. CGen has been part of the GNU toolchain since 2000, when version 1.0 was released. An update was released in 2009 and the tool was considered largely stable and used with over 30 architectures in the GNU toolchain. However, this last year there has been a resurgence in, of interest with bug fixes and new features, migration to scheme version 2 and the repository is also being transferred over to, from CVS to Git. This diagram shows the key components of a GNU toolchain. CGen plays its role in the GNU assembler, GAS, the binary utilities, and the GNU debugger, GDB. Libopcodes captures the syntactic structure of the instruction set architecture. It is used to form the heart of the table-driven assembler and disassembler. The remaining components are largely generic, which means once the RUP codes has been created or updated, you have a working GNU assembler and disassembler. 
The disassembler can be used via the dash D option to obstump or via the disassembly command to GDB. Libsim captures the semantic structure of the instruction set architecture and is used to form the heart of the table-driven functional instruction set simulator. Again, the remaining components are largely generic, which means once Libsim has been created and you have a working simulator, you, you will have a working simulator, sorry. The simulator can be used standalone or invoked with GDB using the target sim command. CGEN starts with a high level hardware view of the world. We start with the definition of an architecture, in our case RISC-V. We then define a number of architecture fami families, which in this case would be 32-bit and 64-bit RISC-V. Within these, we describe a number of machines, which in the case of RISC-V are possible configurations of instruction sets and extensions. We finally define a number of models because any particular machine may have variant implementations. The software view of the world starts with the instruction set architecture, which are associated with particular machines. You might think that risk five, with RISC-V, we can have an ISA for each instruction set extension. But in fact, the ISA is the general term for all the instructions a particular machine supports. We use the machine definition to control what goes into the ISA. Within the ISA, we define instructions which each contain operands, each with a hardware implementation. Let's see what this looks like in practice for RISC-V. We'll start by defining a CGEN de description of 64 RISC-V. First of all, some general aspects of CGEN description. The scheme description always starts by including the standard CGEN header, simplify.inc. All, all of the CGEN entities such as architecture, ISA, CPU, and machines, I, describe, uh, I have described earlier, may have attributes associated with them. Some are predefined, but others are defined within the particular CGEN description. As we shall see later, these are central to supporting RISC-V with all its variants. At various points, we need to define types of entities this uses the same nomenclature as GCC internally from quarter integer QI for 8-bit bytes upwards. We will also need to construct expressions, particularly defining semantics. This largely follows the structure of GCC register transfer language or RTL. Most usefully, there is the C call operation to call out to C code from anything which is too complex for RTL. The first item in your CGEN definition must be the architecture. For the architecture, we define a number of arguments. The name, in this case RISC-V, the comment, which in due course can be used to form part of the generated documentation, a flag to indicate whether bit zero is the least significant bit, for risk five it is. And the machine and ICES used for this architecture. At this stage, we are just building the base 64 risk five and its instruction set. You will see that the name and comment fields appear on all entities defined in CGEN. We then define one or more ISAs. In this case, 64-bit RISC-V, the sizes specified, all 32 bits, relate to the instructions, not the data on which, which the instructions operate.
now we define the next levels of hardware hierarchy. Define CPU as the processor family, not just a single CPU. Convention is that the names of CPUs end in BF. It is here that we specify data size, 64 bits, on which the processor family operates. Later on, we'll look at how we define the 32-bit RISC-V family. And of course, in future, we can define the 128 risk five bit risk five family. Define Mac specifies a particular architecture variant. Historically, this con corresponded to the Mac fields in the binary file descriptor or BDF for the architecture's ELF files. However, for modern highly variant architectures, more detail is needed. Risk five has only two Mac fields in its BDF description for RV32 and RV64. In CGen, we define machine values for numerous instruction set variants. Define model is used primarily to control the semantics, semantics for simulation. We, prepare, we present just a minimal default description at this stage. Conceptually, defined model can offer quite a complex model of an architecture. However, many of the more advanced features have yet to be implemented in CGen. We shall have a look at this in more detail later. Now we define the semantic structure of the lower level entities that make up individual instructions. We start with registers. By convention, hardware names begin with H. All hardware is specified using the define hardware entity. The type argument covers what kind of ha hardware is being speci specified. The program counter has its own type, PC. We then, for the first time, see attributes being used with the ATRA's argument. We specify the predefined attribute PC and lists of mach machines and ISAs with which this hardware entity is associated. For the general register bank, we have the register type. This takes arguments. Uh, the first argument is the width of the register as a GCC mode, DI, double in integer. That is 64 bits. The second argument specifies the number of registers in the list. This is then followed by a mapping of register names to register numbers. Note that you can have multiple names for a register. So in our example, the first register can be named either 0 or x0. When assembling, either name can be used. When disassembling, the first one will be used. In addition to defining our own hardware elements, there are, there are also a number of predefined hardware elements. For example, H memory, which is used for a block of memory. H sint or H uint, signed and unsigned integers. H adar and H iadar for data and instruction addresses. We now need to define the fields that make up the instruction. The convention is to use F to begin field names. Our first example on the top left is a simple field of seven continuous bits, starting at bit six, which is risk five is where we will find the opcode. We use this ISA attribute to list the ISAs which will be used in this, which will use this field. Our second example on the bottom left is a field to be used as an immediate. The mode argument, di, tells us that the value is to be cast to a double integer, i.e. 64 bits. The fields define the physical syntax Opcodes then adds a layer of abstraction to describe what these fields mean. Our third example on the top right defines the destination register, RD. 
It is of type HGPR, which, as you will recall from the last slide, to be the bank of registers. The FRD field, which we have not shown here, gives the index to this bank of registers. Thus, like fields, operands use the ISA attribute to show which ISAs will use them. Our final example on the bottom right defines an immediate operand. It uses this field, uh, it uses the field we defined on the bottom left and predefined type hsint to indicate it will be a signed integer of sign double. We can now pull all these components together to define an actual instruction. The syntax argument is a string defining the syntax to be used by the assembler. The format field builds up the instructions out of previously defined field operands. The fields define fixed parts of the instruction, such as opcode, while operands define variable parts of the instructions, such as registers, numbers, or immediate values. Once again, the ISA attribute is used to specify the ISAs to which the instruction belongs. This is the heart of all you will need to run CGen. Later on, we'll look at some features to simplify this description. But first, we'll look at how to use CGen to generate libopcodes and libsim libraries. CGen has to run as part of the GNU Benutil's GDB repository. However, CGen repository is still separate, so it has to be merged in. Starting by cloning Benutil's GDB repository using Git, and then the CGen repository using CVS. There is now a read-only Git mirror of CGen, which you can use instead. We anticipate that before long, Git will become the master repository of CGen. The GNU CGen project page will provide the latest link to this repository. We don't need all of the CGen repository, since it includes duplicates of many components of the new TILS GDB. All that is needed is a copy of the CPU and CGen directories from the checked out CGen repository into the top level of the checked out Benutils GDB repository. To make life simpler, the Benutils GDP repository given in, given in the prerequisites for this talk includes CGen components. There are two key files making up the CGen description of RISC-V. CPU RISC-V.CPU contains the scheme description of the architecture using all of the elements described earlier. And CPU RISC-V.OPC contains blocks of C code to be added to some of the C source files generated from the screen, screen, scheme description by CGen. After running CGen, files will be generated in two places. Files generated in the opcodes directory of the Benutils GDB source tree will be used to create libopcodes libraries. But files generated in the simrisc 5 directory will be used to create libsim libraries. We need to make some changes to the Benutils GDB auto tools files to tell it to build using CGen. Initially, we'll look at the changes needed just to create libopcodes for the assembler and disassembler. In opcodes slash configure.ac, we'll see a list of object files that will form the libopcodes library. These correspond to the names of the source files that will be generated by CGen. However, it is quite common to use the same file names even for handwritten assemblers and opcodes. So this line may not change. It is the second line using CGen equals yes, which is critical to cause CGen to be invoked. We need to make a number of changes in opcodes.makefile.in. First, 
we define the files which will be generated by CGen to make up libop codes. We then provide a RISC-V dependent rule. This will allow us to build in maintenance mode to regenerate the source files. Finally, we use timestamp rule to regenerate the source files if we are in maintenance mode and the files are out of date. We can then regenerate the configuration files. The build system is quite picky and at present config the configuration files must be regenerated using autoconf 2.69 and automake 1.15.1. This would typically be achieved by changing to the opcodes directory in the source tree and running auto reconf node recursive. While CGen generates all the code files, we need to make a couple of small changes to ensure that the generating disassembly print function is picked up and we get a working disassembler which can be invoked from the obstump command. This is achieved by a small case statement fragment in opcode slash disassemble.c and an external declaration of that function in opcode slash disassemble.h. We can now configure and make the library. The important point is to configure with enable cgen mint. We run make in stages. First, to create the core binutils functionality, then to create the libopcodes library, and finally to create all other components using the libopcodes library. At this point, we will have a working disassembler, and this can be invoked using obstump-d. We now need to use libopcodes to create a GNU assembler. This is not a tutorial in how to write a GNU assembler. I shall concentrate only on the changes needed for creating a CGen GNU assembler. While CGen provides the engine that drives the assembler, there is still some handwritten code which needs to be completed. This slide shows all the functions, macros, constants, and global variables that you need to define in a GNU assembler. There are still, there are all defined in the C file and C header in the gas slash config subdirectory of Benutils GDB. In the case of RISC-V, these files are tc-risc-v.c and tc-risc-v.h. The MD CGen lookup relock function is unique to CGen based assemblers. All the others are needed for a GNU assembler. Many of these functions are very simple, while the more complex ones, CGen will provide some standard helpers. For a CGen-based assembler, the C file should include the generated opcodes slash risc5desk.h and opcodes slash risc5.opc.h headers and the standard gas cgen.h header. Helpers are particularly provided for the functions MD apply fix, MD assembler, MD begin, TC gen relock, and MD operand. Having created the wrapper code, we can now build our assembler. We need to modify the gas configure.ac file to show that it is using cgen, and then regenerate the configuration files using auto reconf dash no dash recursive within the gas directory. We can build and install the assembler. Now we can look at creating the GNU assembler using CGen. To do this, we need to extend our CPU description with semantic information about the behavior of the instructions. We can then generate libsim, which is the engine at the heart of the simulator. In the simulator, it is a harder task than the assembler. We generate one new file to be incorporated in libopcodes. We also generate a large number of simulator files, some in the source tree and some in the build tree. Finally, there is 
generated support for some files which need to be handwritten. We extend our hardware specification in RISC-V.CPU with semantic information. Firstly, for the PC, we add functions to get and set a value. The raw reg operation will call out to a C function, which we will consider shortly. Secondly, the bank of general purpose registers also needs a similar get and set operation, but this time with an index. Finally, the instructions. They need to use RTL to describe their behavior. So in the case of the add immediate and the double integer, the double integer value from the source register is added to the immediate operand value and stored in the destination register. We now need to provide the low level function to the read and write registers. The register numbering corresponds to the numbering used for GDB and is actually held symbolically in the GDB slash sim risk5.h header. For simplicity, on this slide, we have used the actual numbers with general purpose registers numbered 0 through 31 and the PC numbered 32. When you look at the example repository, you will see the sim symbolic values used. We look first at the function to read registers, RISC-564BF fetch register. The function name is derived from the name defined for C CPU family. The buff argument is an area of memory used to return values. The get HGPR and get HPC macros will also have been generated by CGen as accesses to the register state within the simulator. Set DI and set UDI are standard CGen macros to write signed and unsigned double integer values into the buffer. The function to write to registers is RISC-564BF store register. It's quite similar, with buff supplying the area of memory and the values to write into the simulator state. As a result, the length of the data written into memory is returned. There are similar macros for writing register state and reading from the macro. The one difference is writing to register zero in risk five is ignored, since it is hardwired to zero. To indicate this, we will return a length indicator of zero. There are a number, sorry. The code here is largely standard, whether or not you are using CGen. These are interface functions which must be implemented by any simulator. The one difference is that the sim open function must invoke CGen in it. This is the main function for the simulator. The CGen simulator we need to define with SCAR PBB and include both standard CGen and generated CGen headers. Within the sim CPU structure, we need to define CPU data. This uses a type generated by CGen based on the CPU family name, RISC-564BF CPU data. This is guarded by a defined constant also generated by CGen based on the CPU family name. In the sim state structure, the name of the CPUs Max NR processors is defined by CGen generated headers, and we need to include the CGen state with the type CGen state defined by CGen. Note that there are other handwritten files not covered here. Traps, defining sim engine invalid ints to handle exceptions, and risk5sim.h. Once again, auto tools will, files needed to 
needed extending for the CGen-based assembler. The configuration is then regenerated using auto reconf no recursion, no recursive. This slide captures the key changes. You should examine the example repository to see the rules to create binaries and write timestamps. The, stand, the standard simulator is built and installed in the same way as earlier components. And we now have a standalone simulator for the RISC-V architecture. We also need to use the simulator under GDB. All we need to do is to tell GDB to use the libsim library and its simulator and rebuild. We can then use the target sim command to invoke the simulator from within GDB. You will now appreciate that CGen descriptions for an architecture of any size can get very large and repetitive. CGen provides some mechanisms to reduce the repetitiveness. The key to simplification is the scheme macro which can be used to simplify both functions and variables. Often using, often using arguments in place of keyed arguments. A number of these are predefined. For example, on the upper right of the slide, hardware is usually defined with six arguments, name, comment, a set of attributes, type, values, and handler. The DNF macros takes these as six positional arguments. Thus, our definition of the program counter can be reduced to just two lines. Other simplification macros provide for standard fields, operands, and instructions. Readability is further enhanced by macros to define enumerations and symbolic keywords. In this example, two macros allow us to reduce the definition of all RISC-V arithmetic immediate instructions to just two lines of scheme. This has been a whistle-stop tour of the CGen basics. I hope that in combination with the presentation from 2008 uh, and the reference implementation repository that you have, you will have a sufficient information to get started doing your own architecture. However, the architecture as complex as RISC-V throws up a number of complexities which we will need to address. We shall start by looking at how to handle multiple instruction sets in CGen. The first part is easy enough. We define two ISAs. Then we need to add both ISAs to the architecture. And then everywhere we have specified an ISA attribute for instructions, fields, operands, we need to add the second ISA. This is extremely tedious, particularly if in the future we want to add further ISAs. So as shown in the upper right, we define a macro, all ISAs that can be used to specify all the ISAs for an architecture. In the bottom half of the slide, we then see how this can be used to simplify the definition of an instruction or the program counter. Should we add another ISA, such as RV128? In the future, we need only change the macro. For RISC-V, most of the instructions are identical between 32-bit and 64-bit. However, there are a number of instructions that are only 64-bit such as load double. These instructions will be marked as only being, as only belonging to the RV64 ISA rather than all ISAs. This is all we need to do to change for libop codes. We can now build as before and have both 32-bit and 64-bit ISAs uh, supported. For the simula simulator, we need to add a new 32-bit CPU family and a new 32-bit machine. 
At this point, we run into a bug in the CGen. It assumes that all CPU families have the same word size, which is clearly not the case with 32 and 64-bit RISC-V. This is something that we can fix in CGen, but this is not a trivial change, and we have yet to make it. The workaround is to generate the CGen files twice, once for 32-bit and once for 64-bit. The rule which generates the architecture source files is split into 32-bit and 64-bit versions. By adding suffix to make invocation, the generated files will be suff suffix with either 32 or 64. So we end up with two sets of files. Similarly, we split the rule which generates the CPU source files into 32-bit and 64-bit versions. We'll need to add control which rules are used to make to the make files. To do this, we extend the configuration script to define and export variable holding the length of the architecture, xlan. This is derived from the target triplet specified when configuring. We can use the RISC-V xlan variable we set to configure.ac to define a constant xlan with which we will suffix files in our rules to select the correct set of generated files. Finally, we will extend the C complementation flags with a defined constant containing xlan. So any C code can, uh, can also access the size begin, been, being used. Once we have made the changes to configure.ac and make file.in files, we regenerate and configure using auto reconf as before. We shall generate a much richer mix of source files, which we need to incorporate in building the assembler, disassembler, and simulator. For the assembler, the RISC-V configuration file and header will need to be updated to allow the correct architecture to be selected. For the simulator, the changes are rather more extensive as the file names become more complex. In this tutorial, I do not have time to go into further detail. However, the changes may be extensive, but they are also not complex. You shall have no problem seeing what is needed by examining the example repository. So far, we have only concerned ourselves with the base instruction sets for 32-bit and 64-bit RISC-V. Now I shall look at how we handle all the instruction set extensions. We want to select an arbitrary combination of extensions within reason. A separate ISA for each extension would be too heavyweight. Instead, we add a custom bit set attribute to RVEXT with bits for each extension. Because it is a bit set, we can have multiple extensions, one bit per extension. Now we add RVEXT attribute to all the places where we use the ISA attribute. We show two examples. One for the add immediate instruction, add I, which is part of the base instruction set we will use RV32I and RV64I. For the multiply instruction, mule, which is part of the M instruction set, we will use RV32M and RV64M. We are gonna have a lot of extensions, so we provide some macros to simplify the task of adding attributes. We define one macro for each instruction set in this example, ixed and mxed. This is the same idea as we used with the ISAs and the all ISA macro. We'll need, we'll need to know which extensions are needed. We have to modify the M 
D. Pavar's option to build up a mask of the supported extensions when the M. Arch option is passed. This is the file support for C code for the scheme description. We have to modify our RISC-V CGEN in supported to decide if it is a particular instruction, if a particular instruction is in a supported extension based on the information from the argument parsing. The simulator is harder. We cannot support arbitrary combinations of instruction set extensions since we need a machine definition for each simulator target. Instead, we choose a useful set of combinations, such as RV32I and RV64I, RV32IM and RV64IM, and so on. For each of these, we define a machine and then associated instructions with the machine on which they are supported. Thus, in this example, Adamedia is supported on RV32i, RV32im, RV64i, and RV64im machines, while the multiply is only supported on the RVim and RV64im machines. Once again, we define macros to make machine definitions simpler to use. As noted previously, we cannot support all possible combinations of extensions in the simulator. This slide shows the set we currently support in the patch. We also have supported the bitmanip extension, but cannot upstream this until the extension is officially ratified. We need to extend the makefile by enumerating the machines which are supported. There are some features of RISC-V that are particularly particular problems in CGEN. CGEN supports sudo instructions, but assumes a one-to-one -one mapping. RISC-V has some sudo instructions which map to multiple instructions. For example, call becomes add upper immediate PC followed by jump and link register. Even more difficult, li becomes a variable number of instructions depending on the immediate which is materialized. We need to model some exceptions, notably breakpoints and syscalls. These are implemented in traps.c, where we provide a hook which halts the simulator. Syscalls are implemented in the same way but we map from RISC-V Linux syscall numbers to generate numbers and then invoke the standard syscall multi-function. We need to support some CSRs, which are very varied in their behavior. The approach we have taken is to intercept reads and writes to CSRs and implement the behavior by calling out to C code. You can see this in the example on the MISA CSR. We have had the generic RISC-V support for some time. It is in use with one of our major customers internally. However, to test the effectiveness of our implementation, we decided to try implementing the proposed bit manipulation extension. We deliberately gave this work to one of our engineers Maxim Blinov, who had not worked on this on the previous CGEN description before. We wanted to see how hard it was for someone new to work with C the CGEN description of RISC-V, albeit an engineer with deep GNU toolchain knowledge. The first step is to extend RVX with definitions, not just for the B extension, but for all sub extensions. When, when we extend the extension macros and define two new machines, which include the B extension. Clearly, 
we could add more if we wished. And then update all the machine macros to include the B machines where appropriate. The B instruction set architect uh, extension defines one new field and one new operate, operand. So we add these and a macro to stamp out instructions using the new, this new format. Finally, the bulk of the work is to define each new instruction with its semantics. So how long did this all take? Maxim spent seven days working on this, providing support for the 0.92 draft specification. The assembler, disassembler, and simulator all work, although the simulation of three instructions still needs a bit of work. Beyond that, we need to extend the GNU toolchain regression suite with tests for bit manipulation instructions. Currently, this testing is a manual task. I hope that by this stage, you have some confidence that you can develop your own CGen assembler, disassembler, and simulator. It is a tool that we have used within Embercosm for many years, not just for RISC-V, but for many architectures where the customer needs an assembler, disassembler, and simulator in short order. Let us take a look at the current status of CGen for risk five. Thanks to Andrew Burgess of Embercosm, we now have a Git migration of CGen. This is currently a read-only mirror of CVS, but we hope it will become the master in the near future. Jose March, Marchi of Oracle is migrating CGen to Scheme version two in his spare time. It is frustrating that CGen is now reliant on an obsolete version of scheme. The migration is a large job though. I'm sure Jose would welcome assistance with this task. The mailing list was very active in the first half year with this work. It has now gone a little quiet, but I hope this tutorial will encourage more activity. If you would like to contribute, work on the documentation would be really appreciated. As I noted at the beginning of this talk, our work on RISC-V was driven by a customer requirement for 24 hour turnaround for a new instruction in the tool chain. We have had a handful of fixes for RV32GC and RV64GC, and then we anticipate the CGen description will be accepted upstream. This is already a well-established, there is already a a well-established handwritten assembler and disassembler upstream in the new tills. We see no urgency to change something that is known to work. Therefore, we do not propose upstreaming the CGen-based assembler. If others wish to use this, they can use the CGen model to build their own assembler. However, there is currently no integrated GDB simulator upstream. We have submitted a patch for the CGen sim to be incorporated in GDB, which we hope to be merged before too long. I've been working on an application note which captures the content of this talk for some time. This fills in all the detail which we have had to skip in our one hour lecture or tutorial. I appreciate that this will be completed after uh, this summer, fingers crossed. So what is the future work? Well, CGen is mature and most future work is in one of four areas. Keeping the code base up to date by migrating it to Scheme version two, enhancing CGen so it supports architecture variants with different word lengths, and general bug fixing, and finally, improvements to the documentation. The immediate work on CGen for RISC-V is to get the models and simulator upstreamed. We also need to continue to track bit manipulation so we are ready to upstream as soon as the extension is ratified. As many of you well know, my personal research interest is to look at what succeeds CGen. The problem is CGen's models are not that rigorous. 
sale would seem to be a much better starting point. I have started by looking at how we can generate CGen scheme descriptors from sale, uh, from the sale model of RISC-V, and then I plan to complete this work in some time. However, long term, I anticipate that we shall move to generating libop codes and libsim directly from sale. I hope you have found this talk useful. And if you have any projects regarding CGen now or in the future and you'd like some help, please get in touch. I have provided contact details for the Embercosm CGen team on the side. Thank you very much for listening. We do have a couple of minutes for any questions. So it is definitely that it, sale is much more vigorous. And to convert from sale to CGen, you have to lose a lot of information. CGen also, once you get into the internals, and you start wanting to look at perhaps the vector extension things get a little bit more messy and dirty and a bit ugly. And so writing something from sale, yes, OK, it'll be a lot of work to be able to generate uh, libraries for every single sale uh, model. But we'd be able to come together and say, we need to focus on these areas and being good at vectors or the memory model would be probably quite important if you use sale. Okay, that's great. You're looking at that. I think there is a huge duplication of, a, well, overlap, and maybe I would venture to say duplication of effort between what we are doing and this work in uh, synthesizing a back of a compiler, a GDB, uh, an assembler, uh, a uh, binary code analysis framework. And uh, it is our current uh, immediate uh, goal for beginning of next year to migrate or to not retarget, I would say, because this is a front end, to refront end it to sale. And uh, I wonder uh, how much of a potential there is to actually collaborate on uh, removing the du duplication of effort here, because the new big three framework is going to be used, is ours, is going to be using. Um, sale as the, as, as, as the formal spec to start deriving all of these backend things from. Uh, maybe we can just take it offline. That's the question. Of what is our future with, with, with sale? If there is a common future. So I guess uh, to prevent or well, I think the best step forward is perhaps if after this talk we have a sit down chat to see how we can move forward without duplicating stuff. And uh, yes, that'd be very nice. Thanks. <laughs>